Good evening and welcome to Temple Heights Baptist Church for our Wednesday night service. Bienvenidos a nuestra iglesia bautista de Temple Heights uh, por nuestros uh, estudios por uh, los miércoles. We are going to begin with our theme song because it's Missions Month. Thank you. On page 296. We have a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their heart to the right. A story of truth and of mercy, a story of peace and light. A story of peace and light. For the darkness shall turn to Desiree, welcome to our Wednesday evening service and a little break in the middle of the week to come together and study God's word and sing and together. What a wonderful blessing that is. We've got someone special here, a visitor, Richard Moose, and he's going to be with us a little bit uh, later. We'll introduce him, but make sure when we meet and greet that you welcome him wholeheartedly as we do everyone. Uh, and we're in the middle of our mission, not middle, we just started, right? Uh, Sunday was our kickoff Sunday for our missions month and uh, to go tell the nations, tell the nations. And so we uh, had a great start to the conference with uh, Greg Shepard with RTS and uh, the Pratters going to Paraguay uh, and then Dave Dorsey, uh, Dempsey with um, Oasis Pregnancy Care Center. Uh, I don't know, for those who were here, you had the opportunity to uh, um, 
sign up for text messages. And so I did that. And so I'm getting text messages when um, there's a client coming in and uh, uh, the nurse on staff says, please pray for this client. Uh, she's making, she has some hard decisions to make. And so I get to pray for her. And then um, a little bit later, I've gotten texts saying uh, to rejoice because she's chosen life for her child. And so great opportunity. Yes. Uh, so they, they're, you can sign up to be subscribed to get a text, yeah. Oasis is Pregnancy Care Center, and they will uh, send a text out to you when there's a prayer need uh, dealing with uh, uh, abortion, uh, and we pray that they choose life, and so there'll be opportunity to rejoice that they've chosen life. Does that help explain? Okay. All right. Um, but let's open in prayer. Dear Father, we just praise you for today. We praise you for all that you're doing, Lord, and Lord, allowing us to be involved all around the world, Lord. Lord, your passion is the lost, and Lord, that's our passion because it's your passion. And Lord, we just praise you that we get to be a part of it. Lord, uh, may you bless uh, this evening, Lord, with our singing and studying your word, and Lord, uh, Brother Muse coming and sharing his heart for missions as well. Lord, uh, may you be with us in a special way tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. And our next song is on page 422 of Glenn and Nina Hymnooks. No, not one.
our last song of the night is Pass It On on page 309. We're going to switch things up a little bit and uh, give our brother time now before we send people off. But <coughs> I want to introduce uh, Richard Muse. <coughs> He's from Arlington, Texas. He is uh, here to represent M is for Missions. If any of you watched old movies and saw M is for Murder, this is not that. This is M is for Missions. <laughs> or Dial M for Murder. What was it? Dial M. <laughs> Uh, so I want to introduce uh, Brother uh, Richard to us. He's uh, actually helping out at the State Fair tomorrow, in the next couple of days, uh, at another gospel tent, uh, the different one than we've been doing with. Uh, but we'd love to uh, reach out uh, to the lost. Brother, share with us. Well, thank you, Pastor Mass, uh, for allowing me to be here. It is a privilege to be here with you folks here in the Tampa area. Uh, I lived in Orlando seven years and uh, graduated from school, moved out to Texas and been there just about ever since in Arlington, Texas, um, a member of Trinity Baptist Church out there. And M is for Missions is a ministry of our local church, uh, Trinity Baptist, not even a year old, just started in March of, of 2023. And um, the goal here is to get missionaries to the field sooner. Our goal is to send a thousand missionaries to the foreign field. And the way we do that is you'll see so just sort of the operational uh, way that it works in just a couple minutes. But the way we do that is we send out three social media posts a week, Facebook, Instagram, that reach people around the country and around the world. And for someone that is not in a good solid church like this one and mine, um, but they know they need to get the word out around the world, the importance of it, they can go right to our website, it drives uh, those posts to drive people to our website. They can see a missionary on there. Currently we have 25 uh, fundamental independent Baptist King James missionaries right on the website. And if they have someone like, I noticed that uh, last year at your 2023 missions conference, you had Mark and Naomi Byers uh, that were scheduled here and uh, going to Germany. Um, just an, a side note, by the way, uh, they are on our M is for missions website and uh, they just got a house in Germany. So <laughs> if you've been praying for the buyers, then uh, that's an answer to prayer. They just got that within the last week or two. 
uh, update on that. But um, if someone says may, they may have a grandmother in Germany and they say, hey, well, the buyers are going to Germany, um, we'd like to support them. Then they can read the buyer's bio, their prayer needs, some photos, videos, whatever the buyers put out on the website, and they can pull out a credit card, debit card, and support that missionary right from their home in France or in Alaska or in Russia, wherever they might be at the time. They can just do it right from their smartphone. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit different uh, model, ministry model, um, but uh, we believe that if a missionary can get to the field faster, then they can reach that many more people for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so with that in mind, um, we'll go ahead and turn it over to start the uh, video, and then after that I'll open it up for a brief uh, question and answer period. Supporting your own missionary is easy with M is for missions. Go to M is for missions.org and select a country where one or more of our missionaries reside. Once you've chosen a country, you'll see a list of missionaries serving there. Browse through their profiles and select the one you'd like to support. On your chosen missionary's profile page, you'll find their biographical data, prayer needs, and information about their work. This helps you get to know them better and understand their mission. Remember, your support isn't just financial. You can communicate with your missionary by writing letters, praying for their specific needs, sending gifts during special occasions, or even potentially visiting them on their mission field. When you're ready, you can make a donation to support your chosen missionary. You can choose between a recurring donation or a one-time gift. In addition to supporting a missionary, you can also contribute towards the administrative needs of the M organization. This helps us continue our important work. When you click the Donate Now button, you'll be prompted to either register a new account or log in to an existing one. And that's it. By supporting a missionary, you're playing a crucial role in spreading love, hope, and faith around the world. With your donation complete, take a moment to pray for your new missionary. Your prayers offer them strength and encouragement. Visit M is for missions.org today and start making a difference. Okay, that's just a nutshell of what someone um, around the world that might go to the website might see. Uh, we are not in competition with any church's missions program, by the way. Um, the, we bring in the sponsors for the missionaries. Uh, we reach out to churches that would like to partner with us to increase their missions uh, efficiency and going around the, sending other missionaries around the world. Um, and so we, the, the goal is for someone like yourself not to support the missionaries on the program uh, individually. Now, we're not going to stop someone from doing that, but, you know, folks in our church, you know, if they want to give to the program, they can fine do that. Um, but um, that's the whole thing is that we, we reach out to churches for the, for the operational support. So, uh, for example, operations, uh, please pray with us about uh, we have, you know, roughly $1,000 a month in travel costs that uh, need to be allocated or uh, – taken care of uh, about $1,200 in operational support which is like website enhancement website maintenance uh, print costs uh, some things like the, the administrative costs of the program um, 
So uh, please pray for us about that and uh, pray that uh, we'll be able to see many more missionaries coming on board. By the way, also, if you know of a missionary that's not yet to the foreign field, but they are going to the foreign, not domestic, but to a foreign country, uh, they might be on deputation right now. I, I saw a, a group uh, that was here, I believe it was, was it last Sunday? Uh, Robbie and Lauren Prater going to Paraguay. Uh, it looked like they were wrapping up their deputation, but they are not on the field. Uh, they would be a good candidate for something like this. So if you know of someone uh, like that and would like to share the information uh, with them, it doesn't cost them anything to apply. It takes about five minutes just to go online. They can go right to the website and apply right there, and uh, they can do that. We also have prayer cards. I can give you prayer cards afterwards where they can just scan a QR code, take it right to the website and so forth. Uh, any questions uh, at this point? Anybody, uh, thing that you're wondering about? You said, okay, I've never heard of something like that. Uh, uh, no questions or dumb questions, so, yes. Um, when you say that they were going to the field of Paraguay, I just want to make sure that I understood that they were actually going to the churches in Paraguay to do the evangelization. Going to the, uh, to the churches to what? Get the people to come to the field of Paraguay. How do you to, to bring missionaries on? Oh, no, we, we go to churches that would like to partner with us as far as the, the program office itself. And then what we do is we reach out to missionaries. We have missionaries from BIMI and other missionary organizations. Uh, we even have missionaries out of our church that our church supports in Texas that are on the website here. So they get support from our church, but then in addition, any sponsor that would sponsor them on here one time or a recurring cost, they would get additional funds uh, from there. So yes, it's not, we go to the churches not to bring on more missionaries, but if you have missionaries that are not yet on the field, that's the, that's the key. Um, you know, they're already on the field. They, are, they need support as well, but we have to draw the line somewhere. So it's missionaries that are on deputation, not yet to the field, other than maybe a first, second, third survey trip. Just haven't started their first term. So if you know of someone, feel free to uh, contact us, and we'll be glad to. Or you just have them apply. You can just send them right to the website. And right at the bottom of the front page, uh, it'll say begin the acceptance process and uh, they can apply directly there. Yes, good question. All right, what Is else? Is there uh, fees for the website? You go on and you do the website and you put your credit card in, does it do a 2% fee on the back end? How does that work? Yes, that's a good question. Uh, the question is, are there fees on the website? There is no fee for the missionary to sign up uh, to, make, to be on the website. Uh, once they're approved, uh, when someone uh, supports them, through the credit card, debit card, there is the payment processor fee. Uh, we use a company called Stripe, and what they do is they deduct a fee, and then they send the balance of that, which is like, say, 2 to 3%. They send the balance of that to our church, and 100% of what comes to our church goes to that missionary. So what we do is we uh, bring in all the funds from a number of, like, if, for example, if there's uh, Caleb Cavanis going to the Congo, uh, and there's three supporting uh, sponsors coming in for him for that month, then that money is pulled together and we write one check and we do send out a paper check the first of the next month and it goes to him. 100% of what comes into the church goes that. So we just say it's 100% uh, it's of what's given minus payment fees, which is that 2% that you'd get if you go to Amazon or something like that, that type of thing. A lot of times they'll charge the business for that, but uh, it's not always that way. Good question. What else? Anyone know of a missionary that's on deputation that might be of, uh, interested in something like this and getting more funds? It's like, you know, uh, do you know anybody that does not want more funds that's a missionary? <laughs> <laughs> Rhetorical question, but anyway. If you have other questions, uh, please see me after the uh, service. I'll be here, and I've got prayer cards and also uh, brochures, and I'll be glad to answer any other questions at that time. Thank you, Pastor Mason. Right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, uh, we're... This is another opportunity, particularly when we have some missionaries coming in on deputation and uh, we can give them another option. Maybe they haven't heard of this uh, and uh, that, that gives us another tool in our toolbox. Uh, for those who may not be totally aware, uh, we do a faith promise commitment and that's what this month is all about. And so there's these cards and you would uh, write a commitment because I can't support our missionaries by myself, uh, but we as a church body can, a church yeah. family can. Uh, and so then you would put down as the Lord leads, whether it's a month or one time or however you want to do it, I'll figure it out the total total. Yeah. Or Miss Chris will write it on the paper. But I have a spreadsheet that does it automatically. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but we don't take your name. We don't know. We're not going to go knock on a door. Hey, where is your faith promise commitment? Because you committed this number. Uh, we've never done that. In fact, we don't know who these cards are for. Uh, but to, but you trust the Lord for what he asked you to give. Uh, and you trust the Lord that he will be faithful to give it to you so you can give it throughout the year. And so that's what these are about. Uh, and so what uh, Brother uh, Muse is talking about is something additional above and beyond. If uh, one of our missionaries happen to be on that site and you want to say, I want to give directly from my house. Now, Miss Chris would say, just give me a check. I'll write the check with our checks to our, to our own missionaries. That's, there's different options. Miss Chris doesn't want to take credit cards. If you want a credit card, I guess this would be another avenue to go with. <laughs> but uh, different, uh, clearly a different option. And uh, praise the Lord that God has given wisdom uh, to men and women uh, on how to get the word out in, uh, to the world. Yeah. And so I thank you, brother, for coming and speaking to us. And we pray for the state fair. There will be many come to know the Lord uh, through those opportunities. Okay. And so but thank you. All right, let's go through quickly through some announcements of coming up. Uh, ladies meeting. This Friday. This Friday, ladies meeting, Valentine's meeting. You're coming up? You're pushing? Yes. I'm getting pushed aside. It's our Valentine's meeting. We're a fun Valentine's color. Come and enjoy being together. And it's the same night as our Friday night outreach, so you don't have to worry about child care. Come drop them off in the kitchen with Mr. Ed and come to the garage and enjoy time with the ladies. And we'll have a wonderful time of fellowship. And because it's Missions Month, on the 17th, we're having our ladies' luncheon. We have a missionary lady, a missionary wife that's coming in. If you were here on Sunday morning, it was a speaker for Sunday School. He did such an amazing job, missionary to Haiti and Dominica. Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic. I know there's two there. Um, so his wife is going to come and to speak to us. And I'm sure it'll be a real blessing. It's at 1 o'clock. We'll all come in here into the auditorium and let her... Speak to us, and then we'll have a luncheon afterwards. It's for ladies, but really anyone that wants to come is welcome to come and to be blessed by it. So on the 17th, ladies, bring something to eat to share with someone, with everybody. Um, if you need child care on the 17th, let me know so I can make sure that I can arrange it and have somebody there for that. Does that mean me? You know, you have to take care of yourself. Oh, oh yes, he is my child care. <laughs> yeah, that is what that means. <laughs> um, oh, my two boys right there are Angelica. We have a tailor. We have lots of people to choose from. All right, so this Friday night, though, 7 o'clock. All right, so Friday, let's just a quick review. Friday, ladies' meeting and uh, Friday night outreach. Saturday, uh, Brother Jackie will continue on in James. So Friday at 6.30, come on out for uh, that study in James. And then we come into Sunday uh, where we're going to hear from uh, Teru and Robin um, Marshall with Now Ministries. And so we're excited to have them. They're old friends of, our, of the church, and we're glad that they come through uh, every now and then. Uh, he's actually just returned from a trip and just called me up uh, just to check in. <laughs> Funny story, he, uh, he called me up and says, uh, and I, I emailed him the, the brochure here, and he saw that we had the Pratters going to Paraguay. And he says, uh, uh, are, he asked me, are the Pratters still in town? Well, I don't know where his... The line of his questioning was going. He says, no, they've returned back to their home in, in Georgia. I said, oh, well, uh, while I was on the mission trip, I was given a whole bunch of, I don't know what the currency is for Paraguay, Peregrine, uh, per, Peregrine currency. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what to do with it. But I saw you had a missionary going to Paraguay. Can I somehow get it to them? He says, well, they're going to be in language school in Argentina for two years or whatever the case may be. Uh, it says, oh, so they're not going to be able to use it right away. I'll find someone else. But he had a whole lump of, of uh, Paraguayan money. I'm totally uh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know what the currency is. So that was uh, uh, fun. Uh, Gary Smiley with the Gideons will be with us uh, Sunday night. Does anybody know what's happening Sunday night? Super Bowl. Yeah. So, you know, we don't cancel for Super Bowl. And... Uh, you have to weigh, is it more important to watch the game or to honor the Lord and be here? Uh, that's going to be a decision up to you. Now, I can tell you that uh, I've always gotten home at halftime uh, and watched the rest of the game. And clearly, well, let's be honest, halftime show is nothing to be raving about. But if you, you get the best part of the game, the end, who's going to win? And you don't miss anything like that. So you get the best, best of both worlds. 
like Gary Smiley, come here, support him. Gideon's, uh, they're the ones who put Bibles in all the hotels and go to school. Um, Brother Pierce, a, a Gideon. I don't know my status, brother. <laughs> I was a Gideon, now I'm a pastor. I don't know what that means. But uh, uh, my mom got saved from a Gideon Bible. Uh, and so we praise the Lord for the Gideons. And so check the rest of the dates because we've got a lot of stuff coming up, um, including the ladies' meeting on the 17th and men's meeting on the 17th. Valentine's party next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. So if you don't happen to be out on that date with that special loved one, come join us. And then we got the men's meeting uh, on that Friday, on that Saturday, and ladies' meeting. Am I missing anything? Did I cover it okay? Check in with all everyone. Okay. We need some uh, kids for the flag for Awana. All right, which one do you want? All right, let's all stand at attention. All right, salute, flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. To the one flag? I pledge allegiance to the Iwana flag, stands for the Iwana Club, whose goal is to reach boys and girls for the gospel of Christ and train them to serve him. The Bible? I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will hide his words in my heart that I might not sin against God. All right, you can be seated. One of these days they're going to bring a big family Bible and have them hold it up. <laughs> let's open in prayer. All right, let's do our uh, Bible verse. Joshua 1.9 is our Bible verse for today. Let's all say it together. Joshua 1.9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Joshua 1.9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be so not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Desiree, you want to help out with the Spanish part? Josué, capítulo 1, versículo 9. Mira que te mando que te esfuerces y seas valiente. No temas ni desmayes, porque Jehová tu Dios será contigo en donde quiera que fueres. Josué 1, 9. Mira que te mando que te esfuerces y seas valiente. No temas ni desmayes, porque Jehová tu Dios será contigo en donde quiera que fueres. Thank you. Um, Stephen is out sick today, so it looks like some of our Spanish contingents are, are uh, not here tonight either. Otherwise, we'd have them all repeating in Spanish. So Desiree was the only one saying it in Spanish. <laughs> Let's open in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we just praise you for tonight, Lord. We praise you for allowing us to meet another brother, Lord, and always good to meet family. Lord, uh, may you bless him and, uh, and the efforts that you've put before him, Lord, and Lord, uh, protect him on his journeys, Lord. Be with his uh, partners as they're, they're ministering at the uh, Florida State Fair this, uh, this week, Lord. And Lord, we also pray for the Wordless Book Tent also that are ministering there as well. Lord, may you be with our uh, kids as they go off to Awana and learn Bible verses, Lord, and that they can hide in your hearts, Lord. And Lord, be with us now as we look at 1 Samuel, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Awana, head on out. Okay, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 21 tonight. Does anybody want to catch me up on what's happening with David? It's like a movie, isn't it? 
All right, don't embarrass me in front of Brother Muse here. And <laughs> yes, so last week, uh, 1 Samuel 20, let's back up just a little bit. Here's a, found a nice little graphic. Uh, let's start off in, uh, and so in Gibeah is where uh, Saul's palace is. That's Saul's hometown. And so remember we had where uh, Saul threw the spear at David, and David escaped, and then, uh, then they reconciled, and then, uh, then it happened uh, again, and then David went, uh, went home. And his wife, Michal, uh, released him, or, or not released him, but uh, allowed him to escape because they knew that King Saul was going to send, um, uh, send well, the scripture says messengers, but I would call them more of assassins, uh, to the house to kill him, and he escaped. And so he ran to Ramah. Who's in Ramah that he ran to? Samuel. Samuel. So Samuel, the prophet, is in Ramah, so he ran there, and he was basically hiding out in the uh, prophet school, the school of prophets. And then King Saul found out, so he sent uh, several teams to Ramah to kill him, and they all, uh, well, they all, God changed their minds, and they were all uh, worshiping the Lord instead of killing David. And so if King Saul decided to, well, if you can't do it, you can't get someone to do it right, you got to do it yourself. So he went there, and well, he had the same issue where he didn't fulfill his mission, and he started um, worshiping the Lord as well. So that was Rama, and so that gave gave David time to escape. And where did David run to next? Yeah, basically back to Gibeah. Who was there? Jonathan. So he ran to his best friend Jonathan, and he goes to Jonathan and says, "Your dad's trying to kill me." And Jonathan says, "No, he's not." Remember the last time. Uh, Jonathan was able to broker and get King Saul to get his father from killing David, but had not been updated on the latest. And David updated him and says, yes, your dad's trying to kill me. And then Jonathan says, whatever you need me to do, I'll do it. And so we set up a, uh, uh, or there was the, uh, remember the festival of the new moon? And so David asked that he would not, that he could excuse himself from the feast at the king's table. And so the idea was if, King Saul was very upset and angry that David was not there. David would know, or Jonathan would know, that uh, his dad wanted to kill David. If he was okay with it, then he knew everything was, okay, was at peace and everything was okay. Well, King Saul was very upset and very upset at Jonathan. I threw a spear at Jonathan. So that made Jonathan very angry and solidified in his mind that, yes, his father wanted to kill David. And so they had set up a little message system out in the field uh, David was supposed to show up on the third day, and D Jonathan was going to um, shoot an arrow. If the arrow went beyond uh, his uh, servant boy, then that would show David that, yes, you need to flee. King Saul is going to kill you. If it shows, if it shoots it under, uh, then everything was okay. Well, it went over, right? And so they, after the, uh, the lad left, uh, King, uh, David and Jonathan said their goodbyes. Uh, Jonathan committed to protecting David as much as he could, and David committed to protecting Jonathan's family uh, as he knew, well, at some point, David's going to be killing uh, you know, David, uh, King Saul's family. And so Jonathan wanted want to know his children and his family line would be protected. And so that's where we left off, and he goes and flees from that location. And so we that's where we continue in chapter 21. So first Samuel chapter 21 and verse 1, then came David to Nob. So now we're going to Nob. So there we are in Nob and we're going to spend this evening in Nob. And so we go to Nob and who's in Nob? We read here Elimelech the priest. And Elimelech was afraid at the meeting of David and said unto him, why art thou alone and no man with thee? So David goes to Nob and Nob is where the tabernacle is right now. And we find here that this is where David goes to. Remember, so he goes, he's already gone to Samuel. He's already gone to his best friend. Now he's going to the tabernacle, seemingly for some protection. And so this is where he goes in Nob. Now we all love the meaning of names and Nob just means high place. High place. At this time, it's known as the city of priests. This is apparently where the tabernacle is currently located. 
The exact location is not known for sure, but is believed to be a town situated in the southern portion of the land uh, given to the tribe of Benjamin and is identified as the village of Shaphat, uh, north of Jerusalem. Some also think it's on Mount Scopus, which is a little bit to the east. Uh, but anyway, it's definitely within sight of Jerusalem, uh, uh, a mountain, a hill within sight of Jerusalem, over kind of overlooking Jerusalem. And we see that in Isaiah 10.32, which says, as yet shall he remain at Nob that day. He shall shake his hand against the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. So we find this connection with Nob being close to Jerusalem, able to see Jerusalem. So this is where the tabernacle, uh, where we find the tabernacle right now. Where has the tabernacle been for about 430 years? I remember, remember that city. Remember Shiloh? It's been sitting at Shiloh for the longest time. And what happened at Shiloh, particularly when Eli broke his neck? Remember the Philistines captured the, captured the Ark of the Covenant? And so the Ark of the Covenant went on a little journey, and uh, God had them have uh, um, basically hemorrhoids in the population, and so they wanted to get rid of it as fast as they could. And so it got back into the hands of of the Israelites. And so last time we saw the location of the tabernacle was 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 2, which says, It came to pass while the ark abode in Kirjath Jerim, that the time was long, for it was 20 years, and all the house lamented after the Lord. So that's the last location, but now it shows up in Nob. We're not quite sure how it went from one place to the other, but now it's in Nob. And so here in Nob, we're introduced to a man named Elimelech. Elimelech, and he's the high priest. So Elimelech, Elimelech, that name means my brother is king. My brother is king. And we know from lineage that he, his father is Etab, and his son is Abathar. We also know that his great-grandfather is Eli. So it's Eli. So Anybody remember some prophecies that was given about Eli's descendants? That his descendants wouldn't carry on. At some point, that lineage would stop. And so the lineage is still going on, but it will soon stop underneath King David, where Zadok takes over as the, uh, the high priest. And so we find Elimelech. He goes to Elimelech. All right, so what's Elimelech's reaction when he sees David come in, come, come approach him? He's afraid. Why would he be afraid? It's all right, yeah. I was reading, uh, one of the commentaries I was reading had to do with David come, and Elimelech knew that David was in charge of armies. He was a commander of armies, and why was David coming to him? I, I think I'm more like Brother Jerry. I think word got out that King Saul wanted David, and he was an outlaw. And now why is David coming here? I don't really want to get involved with an outlaw situation and put myself in harm's way with uh, King, King Saul. Or maybe he was concerned with, well, he killed Goliath. What is he going to do to me? I, you know, so he was afraid. Not exactly sure, but there's a lot of things going on with David and Elimelech and what rumor mill Elimelech had heard. But he was afraid uh, of David when he approached. And so what is he asking? What is he asking David? What are you doing? Why are you alone? Why are you alone? So then uh, go back to verse 1. Then came David to Nob, to Elimelech the priest. And Elimelech was afraid at the meeting of David and said to him, Why art thou alone and no man with thee? Because David, you know, he's commander of an army. Right? Why are you all by yourself? This is very unusual, uh, and something's not right that you're all by yourself. And so David responds, and he, David's going to do a bit of uh, fibbing, fibbing here. He's uh, not going to tell the tell the whole truth. And we see see this in verse two. 
And David said unto Elimelech the priest, The king hath commanded me a business, and it hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. So what is David telling? It's for me to know and you to find out. It's, uh, you, uh, you don't have a right to know. I'm on a secret message from King Saul. And clearly, Elimelech knew that David was, well, at one time, very favored of, Dave, of King Saul, almost King Saul's right-hand man. So what David was saying would have been understandable, depending on how much Elimelech knew about the current situation. But here David is saying, I'm on a secret mission. I do have men out there, but they're, they're not with me right now. They're, they're beyond your sight. Uh, and if this is secret, it's not something for me to let you know. I'm on a secret mission. I'm told specifically I'm not to let you know. Well, that's kind of good, good cover, isn't it? So the special mission. Verse 3. Now, therefore, what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in mine hand, or what there is present. So now David asks for something. What is he asking for? Maybe more than ask, more of a demand. What is, he, what is David asking for? Food. Well, you would think the commander of an army wouldn't have to ask the high priest for food. <laughs> but he's asking, asking, give me five loaves of bread. And if you have a lot of men out there, does five loaves of bread cut it? David's not Jesus. He's not going to feed a thousand with five loaves of bread and <laughs> two small fishes. Right? But he's asking for five loaves of bread. David is hungry. He's on the run. Remember, he's on the run. And he's going to uh, what he's hoping is a, is a safe place. A safe place. So he asks for five loaves of bread or whatever you have. Or whatever you have. If there's anything there, I could take whatever you have. Verse 4, And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under mine hand, but there is hollowed bread, if the young men have kept themselves at least from women. So the priest says, we don't have any, uh, any normal bread here. We have bread that's served in the temple, or the tabernacle in this case, served in, in, the, in, the, in the tabernacle. It's, it's holy bread, specifically for the Lord. And he puts a qualification on it, um, which we'll get a little bit later, about eating the bread. So what is this hollowed bread? What is this holy bread? Well, one of the pieces of the furniture in the tabernacle was the table of showbread. Can anybody name the furniture? Furniture? The furniture in the tabernacle. You can cheat if you want. <laughs> so we have the Ark of the Covenant, right? And so the Ark of the Covenant, the, if you remember, the tabernacle is divided in two places. The, the holy, the, uh, the holy of holies, and then the holy place, and it's divided by a, a um, uh, I'm going to say curtain, a, a curtain, um, and so the Ark of the Covenant is set back there, and when, when is the only time that the high priest go back there? Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, only one day of the year could they go back to where the Ark of the Covenant was, but the holy place, the priests are going in and out of, and there's there's three other pieces of furniture in the holy place. Uh, one of them is the, the golden lamp stand, and so that's lit. And then the other one is the, arc, the uh, uh, altar of incense. And so there will be a whole process to keep that running where there will be incense coming up from this altar. There's a large altar outside, right? That's where all the sacrifices are taking place. This is a, a, an altar, a small little altar inside that just had burning incense going. And then there will be a table with showbread. You know, I was thinking the other day, why these four pieces of furniture? Well, one, and, and I could be totally off base, but this is my thinking. Uh, the thought had occurred to me, well, we have the Trinity, right? We have the, the, the Father, so the Father would be represented by the Ark of the Covenant. And we have the altar of incense that's representing the Holy Spirit. And then we have the duality of Christ. Uh, he is light and he is bread bread of life, uh, and he is light. I don't know. I, that thought had occurred to me. I haven't read that anywhere, but uh, uh, just the interesting aspect of the furniture within the tabernacle. So on the table of showbread, 
and there would be put, uh, also known as a table presence, uh, would, bread would be put, special bread would be put there and always present on the table. We see this in Exodus 25, 30, which says, Thou shalt set upon the table show bread before me always. You're going to put bread on the, on the table. Okay, what, what, what's about this bread? So Leviticus 24, verse 5, talks about the bread. Gives a whole description of the bread. And thou shalt take fine flour and break, bake twelve cakes thereof. Two tenths deals shall be in one cake. And thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row, upon the pure table before the, before the Lord. In other words, pure gold table. And thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row, that it may be on the bread for memorial, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And shall be Aaron's and his sons, and they shall eat in the holy place, for it is most holy unto him of the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. All right, so we have a description of this bread. We can see the amount of flour that's put in the bread, uh, in, into the cake. So two-tenths deals of fine flour, and we find this is what the cakes are made out of. And there's 12 loaves made, and we sometimes we think of loaves as, a loaf, <laughs> uh, but it's more like a, a pita, like a flatbread. It's a flatbread. And so these would be uh, 12 different flatbreads and be arranged in, in two piles or two rows uh, with six in each. And so they'll be laid there. And then they'll be covered with frankincense. And we've seen frankincense with uh, Jesus' birth and uh, with uh, Jesus' death. And so uh, kind of a, you know, a signifying death. Uh, but uh, frankincense would be put on top of the, the bread. And it would be served as a memorial, a reminder uh, of, of the Lord. And it was set there each Sabbath day. So once a week, uh, bread would, new fresh bread would come in to the, to the tabernacle and placed on, on the table of showbread. And then we find who are, who are the only ones that are allowed to eat it. Aaron and his sons, right? The priests. The priests are the only ones who are allowed to eat this bread. The only ones allowed to eat this bread. Further, we find that the Kothites, uh, which will be uh, one son of uh, one of the sons of Levi, was responsible for the care of the table of showbread. So Numbers chapter 4, verse 4, This shall be the service of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation about the most holy things. Jumping into verse 7, says, And upon the table of showbread they shall spread a cloth blue and put thereon the dishes and the spoons and the bowls and covers to cover with all, and the continual bread shall, uh, shall be there on. 1 Chronicles 9.32, And other of their brethren of the sons of Kohathites were over the showbread to prepare it every Sabbath. So it seems here that the Kohathites are baking the bread every Friday and is placed in the tabernacle every Saturday, and it sits there for the whole week till new fresh bread comes in. And so David's coming on the scene, and he's asking uh, for bread. Well, uh, Elimelech says, well, we're about to transition the old bread with new bread. So maybe David's actually there on a Sabbath day itself. Again, back to 1 Samuel 21, 4, it says, And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under mine hand, but there is hollow bread, if the young men have kept themselves at least from women. So Emelink said, I'll give you one qualification for eating this bread that uh, you have kept yourself pure and clean uh, for the past several days. Uh, if you want to read more about that, that's Leviticus chapter 15, verses 16 through 18. And so he gave this condition to receive it, that he had to be, those who eat it had to be ceremonially Clean. Verse 5 says, And David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it, was, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. Well, David then testifies, yes, he's kept himself clean for the past several days. Uh, he has not had any relations with any women, and he... Uh, and his men haven't either as he's testifying here. And clearly he's again telling a fib because he's been on the run. So he hasn't been with his wife for a while to begin with. 
Um, so he's saying, yes, I'm okay with this. Uh, I meet those qualifications for that. So yeah, he is answering truthfully, but it's not, you know, not really, he hasn't purposely kept himself clean for eating the bread. And so he was richly clean then and has even more so beyond the qualifications uh, just because he's been on the run. So verse 6, so the priest gave him a hollowed bread, for there was no bread that, there but the show bread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. So here we have this exchange of the show bread in the tabernacle, and what did the Elimelech do? He gave him the bread to eat, right? He gave him the bread to eat. So the question is, and I know our time is coming to an end, the question is, did David break God's law in eating the bread? Did he? Did he break the law in eating the bread? He's not a priest, right? He's not, huh? Leviticus 24, 9 says, And it shall be Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat in the holy place. Is David related to Aaron? No, he's related to who? Judah, right? Judah. He's from the line of Judah. He's not in the line of Aaron. So we have Levitical law saying this bread is for the priests. So David was not a priest, so he was technically unlawful for him to eat the show bread, which is kind of interesting. Why did Elimelech say it's okay for you to eat and came up with a reason to put qualifications on this? So why did that happen? So Jesus actually refers to this story in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 12 Verse 1 says, At the time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. What is Jesus and the disciples doing at the moment of this story? They're walking along the road, and what are the disciples doing? They're plucking corn from the side of the road, and they're eating, right? Why are they eating it? They're hungry, right? This is not complicated. They're hungry. What day is it? Sabbath day. Oh, that should raise some red flags here, right? What day is it? Sabbath day. And they were just eating because they were hungry. Anything wrong with that? Well, the Pharisees thought there was a problem. Verse 2, but when the Pharisees saw it, oh, we got, we got Jesus. Then they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Now, clearly we know the Pharisees take the law and then add to it and make it more stricter than God intended to be. But uh, they're saying, your disciples have disobeyed the law. So who saw the disciples pluck the corn on the Sabbath day? The Pharisees. So how does Jesus respond? Well, he responds by telling the story of David. Now, how did the Pharisees view David? Very well, very high, yeah. Upon a pedestal. David could do no wrong, even though we know he did a lot of wrong, right? Uh, David, right? How did the Pharisees view Jesus? Awful, right? They, they want to find any way to trip him up, and they, they, Jesus is just a thorn in their side, right? So here they got him. And so Jesus is going to respond by pointing out what happened with David <laughs> In the table of showbread. Verse 3. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did? We just read that. This is what Jesus asked. Have you read this? When he was hungered, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. What is Jesus pointing out here? David broke the law, right? Wasn't it not lawful for him to do that? Who was supposed to eat it? The priests. Not David. David's not a priest. So Jesus is pointing out the law right there, right? He's not, he's not uh, oh, you can disregard the law. He's, this is the law, right? Verse 5. Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? What does that mean? How do the priests profane the Sabbath? Who's working on the Sabbath? The priests, right? Well, let me tell you, Sundays are a work day for me. <laughs> 
uh, Sunday school teachers, anybody else, it's a work day because we're serving and working, right? God set up the Levites to run the temple, run the tabernacle, do the sacrifice, everything going on. This is the Sabbath day, a day of rest. They are not resting. So here Jesus is pointing out, what about the priests? They're working on the Sabbath day. Are they blameless? Verse 6, but I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Well, now he's pointing himself. I'm greater than all the law. I created, I am the law. I created the law. Verse 7, but if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Jesus was made for the Sabbath, not the Sabbath for Jesus, right? And we can see this as uh, mentioned in Mark and in Luke. Mark has an interesting way of putting it. Putting it. Verse 27 of Mark chapter 2. Let's go to Mark 22, verse 25. And he said unto them, Have ye never read what David did when he had need and was unhungered, he and they that were with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar, the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat but for the priest, and gave also to them that were with him. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And so here's this law of being very strict on the issue uh, of eating the bread. And so what does this mean? What is Jesus saying? Is Jesus condemning David's actions or condoning David's actions? Is Jesus saying David did wrong or is Jesus saying David did right in eating the bread? Restating a fact. Or how about the disciples who were, who were hungry on the Sabbath and they ate corn? Were they in the wrong or were they in the right? They were hungry. David was hungry. Well, what about the one that was healed on the Sabbath? Was it wrong for them to be healed on the Sabbath or right to be healed on the Sabbath? Or what about if your ox falls into the dish on a Sabbath? Do you leave it in the ditch on the Sabbath or wait till... Well, in this case, Sunday, the next day, would you leave it there till the next day? Because you can't get it out because it's the Sabbath, right? Clearly, today we have rules and laws, but we find here there's a different case when there's an emergency. Ambulances run through red lights, Right? If uh, you had a, a loved one who was in an accident and they're in the ambulance or you, they were with you and you got to get in the hospital, you're going to do whatever you can to get them in the hospital, right? Right? Uh, if you get pulled over and said, oh, my, 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 uh, my loved one here is, is, is had a heart attack or whatever the case may be, I got him to get to the hospital. What is the police officer going to do? Give you an escort, right? Even though you broke the law, going to give you an escort. Right? That emergency trumped the law. Right? So David, even though he broke the law, and Christ is not condoning what he did, but he also is all, there's a hunger and a need. And so David's pointing out that, okay, these people are hungry. It's okay. Right? What's your intention here? You're not having a feast on the Sabbath. You're starving, or your ox is hurt, or someone's hurt, and you're taking care of it. And so we find the law uh, has some leeway uh, in doing this. So Jonathan would like to say, you know, I should be able to speed all the time. No, you can't. But there may be a certain situation where it would be appropriate to break the law to get someone to the hospital. Does that make sense? And Jesus is giving that leeway here. And so Jesus is actually using David's example for the Pharisees trying to trap him in there. Uh, trap them in the law. The law was not created. Uh, Jesus is above created the law, right? Jesus created the law, and it has its intention. So showbread, of course, gives a wonderful picture of Jesus, who is the bread of life. John chapter 6, verse 35 says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Hebrews 9, 1 says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and worldly sanctuary, for there was a tabernacle made, the first, where it was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Jesus is the bread of life. He provides us life. He didn't put, create 
great, he didn't want us to be under a burden of the law. He wanted us to be free, and he died for us. He provides the bread of life. So this is the story of David as he's on the run. He's hungry. He's finding sanctuary and the tabernacle, and Abimelech, well, he sees a need, or he's scared of David, one or the other, <laughs> and he provides bread to David. And we're going to have to pick up the story next week. We're going to find that there was actually a spy right around there in Saul, David, and he's going to report back to King Saul, and David's going to be on the run again. He's not going to spend hardly any time here at the tabernacle where his attention may have been finding a place of sanctuary, but he's going to have to leave immediately. And so we're going to talk about that next week. Goliath's sword comes into play again. So a very fascinating uh, story about David on the run. Question, comments? All right, let's go to prayer. Dear Father, well, Lord, we praise you for today. We praise you for your word, Lord. And Lord, we praise you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, those occasions where we've stepped over the line and an, an issue, and Lord, you said you've provided us that mercy. Lord, we praise you for that. Lord, give us wisdom and discernment, Lord, that we follow you in all things, Lord. Lord, that we reach out to others, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. On a side note, uh, we want you to be here at church on Sunday. We'll call that the law. But if you're out there and you have an opportunity to share the gospel with someone, please share the gospel. <laughs> it's okay to skip church if you're sharing the gospel. If you have an opportunity on Super Bowl Sunday to share the gospel with somebody, please be there. But if not, be here. So what's your purpose for Sunday night? Is it to share the gospel or not? All right. Let's, uh, we got our purpose.